Hey everyone, and welcome to Mint Casts, our Mint Press podcast series. I'm Manara Mohawish, editor in chief of Mint Press. Thanks again for joining today's podcast, where we'll be discussing GMO labeling, Monsanto, and the one year anniversary of the March Against Monsanto. One year ago this week, over 2 million people in 436 cities in 52 different countries around the world marched against agriculture giant Monsanto, which is also the largest producer of genetically engineered seeds. The movement started in response to the failure of California Proposition 37, a ballot initiative that would have required labeling food products made from genetically modified organisms. Which brings us to where we are today in the battle to get GMO labeling, or GMO food, labeled in our grocery stores. Do Americans have the right to know if their food is being, if their food is made from genetically modified organisms? It's actually a topic being discussed by our lawmakers. Currently, Vermont is the only state that has passed legislation requiring GMO foods to be labeled in a historic move just last week. And this weekend, the march against Monsanto is expected to draw millions of people from around the globe again to peacefully advocate for GMO labeling and bring attention to Monsanto's exclusive patenting rights over seeds and genetic makeup. And joining me today to talk about all of this is Nick Burnaby, activist, Burnaby, Nick Burnaby, <laughs> activist and organizer for the march against Monsanto. I know I was going to get it wrong, but at least I tried. Um, so, Nick, I'd like to start with the basics. There's obviously uh, no, a lot of content. You did, you did better than most people do. Okay, good, good. Um, I'd like to start with the basics. I know there's a lot of controversy surrounding GMOs. Is there any scientific evidence that suggests that consumption of genetically modified foods poses a threat to our health? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, there, there's been studies that showed that uh, uh, hamsters fed BT crops uh, have shown infertility after the second or third uh, generation. And uh, the main concern to me is the pesticide use that goes along with these GMO crops. When you have these Roundup Ready crops that are genetically modified to be resistant to uh, herbicides like Roundup and glyphosate, what we end up happening, what we end up having, is an increased level of pesticides that are inherently in these GMO crops, and that's, to me, where the biggest problem is: is the amount of pesticides, the increased pesticides used in these GMO crops, uh, which are causing severe kidney damage, chronic, chronic kidney failure, um, infertility, damage to the fetus. They're finding, they're finding um, these herbicides now in breast milk of, of nursing women, and. Uh, you know, there's a bioaccumulation that Monsanto and these other corporations, the research that they claimed, uh, they claimed that this bioaccumulation wasn't happening, but unfortunately, uh, that research isn't true, and there is bioaccumulation, and we're starting to see high levels of pesticide um, in these populations that are exposed to these crops, and there's no telling the long-term damage that we're going to see. We see the short-term damage, increased amounts of cancer. Um, kidney failure that's been documented. That's why Sri Lanka just banned uh, the glyphosate herbicide because of the kidney failure. And we're seeing it down in, in, in many of these third world agricultural um, areas where, where it's leached into the drinking water. And it's a combination of these pesticides, exposure, uh, whether physically on the skin, in the fields, or in the drinking water, that's causing a lot of damage, internal damage to people. Wow. <laughs> That was a lot more than I had expected you to say. And if, if you may, could you just speak up a little bit louder um, so our listeners can hear you better? Um, oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> talk to me a little bit about Proposition 37 um, and who lobbied against GMO labeling in the first place. Uh, Prop 37 was California's uh, uh, GMO labeling bill that unfortunately was stopped due to about $40 million that were pumped into the state from outside. Uh, corporate funding to stop this GMO labeling um, process. Now, it wasn't exactly the most comprehensive bill anyways. It gave exemptions to a lot of people, like restaurants and things like that. But basically what happened is you had a huge effort by the GMA, which is the Grocery Manufacturers Association, which is basically a conglomerate lobby of all these big, uh, big food companies like Monsanto and Kellogg and, you know, uh, just these really big food companies that not just the biotech but also the grocery manufacturers like uh, the people that make uh, the food uh, the the food for the kids the box food the processed food and they all put their money together in this GMA which is a it's a just a huge um, lobby that 
they lobby the government to make favorable conditions for these big corporations. And GMA is the main uh, the main group that oppose GMO labeling here in California, just because they're afraid that if they do label GMO foods, then the consumers will start to choose not to consume them. Right now, it's kind of it's kind of uh, one of these things where we don't know if we're eating GMOs because none of it's labeled, except for now in Vermont. By next summer, everything is going to be labeled. That's a huge, huge deal because that's the first state that has legitimately labeled GMOs. But Prop 37 gave a lot of momentum towards this movement, towards this march against Monsanto, because there was just so many activists, so much grassroots, um, so much grassroots movement going towards this labeling bill, and to have it shut down by these four, this 40 million dollars of outside money, it really made a lot of people out of, uh, made a lot of people angry, and it really gave a boost to this movement. So it, it's it's one of these things where we kind of see, while it's not good that the corporations were able to lobby it to stop it. But at the same time, for every action, there's a reaction, and what, from what they did, it gave us more momentum to push forward. And now we see Vermont um, passing this labeling effort, and I don't think it would have been done without without um, this process going on beforehand. And now we have Vermont, as you said. What other states uh, do you foresee uh, passing this kind of legislation? Well, uh, I think California will probably pass it in 2016. Uh, Connecticut has already passed GMO labeling, but they have to have five states that that are in the same area in order to enact it. They've got a few states uh, in the Northeast that are getting ready to um, pass GMO labeling. But I think that it's going to be, it, it's one of these things, kind of like the medical marijuana stuff, it's going to be, in a few years from now, we're going to see 20, 30 states that are going to have this kind of legislation. And there's already a lot of states that are pushing forward now. Oregon just had another had one that went up, and uh, it's it's still in the process. Uh, Washington had one that went up last voting season, and that one got shot down. Similarly to the way that Prop 37 went down by corporate funding and negative ad campaigns and misleading ads. Um, but I think that in a few years, if this momentum continues, we're going to see a big move uh, at the state level. To, to get the, these laws in place. Now, the one thing that is concerning is what's called the Dark Act, uh, which is a, a, it's a law being proposed in Congress right now, which they call a, 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 a what's it called, a, a voluntary labeling. Um, and basically what this, this, this law is, it's, it's, it's being pushed, mis it's a misleading law. And it's being pushed uh, as a way of, of getting GMO labeling, but in, in reality, it actually isn't. In reality, what it does is it creates a federal jurisdiction that supersedes the state right to label their own food. So it'll basically make it illegal for any state to require GMO labeling, and it'll all be mandatory. Um, and I, I don't believe that the federal government should be taking on more power. I think they've They've proved uh, they've proved that they are not very good at doing these kind of things already. So I think it's better left in the states' hands. I think that the movement should go state to state, and and then until we get all 50 states, I don't think the federal government should be involved in it um, because they tend to favor more with the corporations, and the states tend to represent more of the people. And if you look at the polling numbers, the people by an overwhelming majority want GMO foods labeled, and uh, the federal government just doesn't reflect that public opinion. And you mentioned how much money was being uh, put into the anti-labeling <laughs> movement, I guess you could call it, by these companies. Who are these corporations that are that are actually lobbying and, and pouring all this money? And could you name them? Be more specific on who these companies are. Well, yeah, it's all the it's all the regular actors. You, I mean, we have General Mills, Kellogg, um, Monsanto. You got the big dairy uh, companies. Uh, I mean, any any company that you see in the grocery store, pretty much any of these mainstream food companies, they're basically part of this lobby, and it's the food establishment. They all work together because none of them want GMO labeling because they all use GMOs. I mean, in almost all of these products that you see on the shelves in the store, they either contain soy or they contain cor uh, corn syrup, and both of those products are 90% genetically modified, which means that any any of these mainstream brands. And I think there's 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 hundreds and hundreds of brands that are part of this thing. Um, any of these brands, if they were if they were to have to use this GMO labeling, it could potentially affect their bottom line. Now it's 
they, the, the main talking point that comes out of these negative uh, advertisements uh, that come out of these anti-GMO campaigns are that it's going to raise costs of everybody for their food. But in reality, it's just one tiny, it's like a three word, it's adding three words to the end of the label that's already there. So in reality, there's not really a cost increase in the food. But what, what the reality is, is that it's going to affect the bottom line of these mainstream food producers as people start to realize, oh, this contains genetically modified food. I don't know. I'm not really sure if that's good for me or not. So I'm going to try to make, I'm going to make, you know, tr find an alternative. And that's what people are really scared of because... They don't want uh, – the corporations don't want to lose their control over the food supply because that's – they're able to aggregate so much control over it. They're able to lobby the government and, and keep this kind of relationship where it's one, you, one scratches the other's back and the other scratches their back. Um, if we start to see this, this trend where the GMO labeling starts to pass in all these states – we're going to start to see a, a more of a decentralization of the food supply as people start to make better choices and choose smaller, more healthy options from smaller companies that aren't that aren't so polluted and and aren't don't have such bad practices. And I think that's what really scares them is the sense of control. And 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 uh, whether they pass this GMO labeling or not, I'm sure you've noticed. I'm sure most of the people watching um, have noticed that there's a lot more options now in the stores, a lot more organic options a lot more products that are labeled non-GMO. So, you know, whether the government makes makes a move on this stuff or not, I think the people are making the move on their own. So, I'm not I'm not so uh, I'm not really worried about the GMO labeling because I think it's going to come either way, just like this uh, uh, liberalization of the marijuana policy. Um, just because the movement has taken place in the people and people are starting to realize, look, we're tired of being sick. We're tired of having diabetes. We're, we're, we're worried about why everybody's getting cancer and why so many people are infertile nowadays. And so people are just starting to realize, well, the thing that you intake the most of is your food and your water. So obviously the, the partial, part of the reason we're getting so sick is from all the bad food. And the, the, the thing for me that's really concerning is that the poor the poorer areas are the ones most affected by this. The, where I live in Chula Vista, down here in San Diego County, we're in a in a in a fairly poor area, and we have the highest rate of diabetes in the whole county because anywhere there anywhere there there's poor people that can't afford good food, you end up having higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of obesity, and things like that because people don't have access to the organic food. They're eating you know McDonald's, Jack in the Box, everything with this high fructose corn syrup. Um, so that's what's really that's concerning. So affordable, right? Exactly. Um, Part of this movement and what, what I'm really concerned about, being from a poor area, is increasing the access to good food into these poor areas. So it, to me, uh, you know, labeling GMOs isn't really going to fix that problem, but it's starting this decentralization of the food supply and getting communities back in back control of their food supply is where we can really make the, the greatest amount of change. Right. And it's educating uh, people in a very, uh, you know, on a, on a small grassroots level, like you said. Um, you know, let's talk about Monsanto for a little bit. Um, one of the most controversial things that is known about Monsanto is uh, their exclusive patenting rights over seeds and genetic makeup. Um, Monsanto insists that its seeds improved agriculture by helping farmers produce more from their land while conserving resources such as water and energy. How does Monsanto continue to forge its monopoly on the world's food supply? Well, Monsanto, if you look, it's, it's, it's a perfect example of how they go about this labeling campaign. It's subversion, it's, it's uh, hidden, it's blackmail type of tactics. They're not they're by no means are these people uh, a legitimate business. They don't go about competing with other businesses transparently. They go about using government influence, mm -hmm. and they go about trying to, you know, more or less bribe these people. They've got their their officials in the FDA. They've got their officials in the USDA. Uh, literally, the head of the FDA is a former Monsanto uh, attorney. And there's there were leaks that came from uh, Chelsea Manning that showed that there were. U.S. diplomats literally lobbying European nations to to implement these GMOs. It was basically th they're threatening economic warfare if, if uh, countries like France were, were to turn down GMOs. So these people don't compete. It's not that the people the people around the world aren't asking for these GMOs. Monsanto is going in through the government side, 
greasing the pockets of politicians in, in second and third world countries and then forcing their product into the population. Now just like in Haiti after the earthquake, the big earthquake that hit Haiti and devastated the area, Monsanto came in and donated a bunch of GMO corn seed and the farmers there literally burned the crops to the ground because they didn't want them. You know, so, so people around the world are rejecting these crops. The only reason Monsanto is able to stay embedded in these, com in these countries is through their government influence. And now what they're doing is they're patenting these seeds and they're forcing everybody to pay royalties on these seeds. The farmers can no longer save the seed. If they save the seed, guess what? They have to pay royalty back to Monsanto. And then what's happening is that if these proprietary genetics end up cross-contaminating into a field that's right next door, and I've got a friend up in Oregon that has a farm, and this, this problem, every year they run into this problem. They have to go through a lot of more work, a lot of more costs, just to ensure that their crops remain organic because of this cross-contamination. So, so when you have these GMO crops contaminating um, non-GMO crops, if, if the contamination, the genetic contamination gets high enough, Monsanto can go in there and literally sue these people and force them to either pay them royalties or to destroy the crop because, because they're saying that they're stealing their property. Now, if you ask me, that, that policy is completely backwards because if, if you ask me, it should be the other farmers suing Monsanto because their product has been um, being contaminated by Monsanto product. But since Monsanto has, is such a big corporation, they've got such a strong uh, law team, they've got so many attorneys and so many people in high levels, and when, when, when a small farm comes under the gun from Monsanto, it's really hard because small farmers can't afford to hire these uh, expensive lawyers and to have 20 people on their, on their uh, 20 attorneys under their, you know, under their um, um, payroll. You know, and, how, so and, does, and does Monsanto, I mean, do they have people coming to these farms? I mean, are they, uh, how, do they, how do they get access to the crops of these local farmers? Uh, yeah, there's actually been reports of un, uh, uh, unauthorized testing of these crops. So Monsanto will send people out, they'll go uh, test people's fields, test people, people's crops, sometimes mm -hmm. without even getting permission from the farmers. They'll just go in there and do it. Um, and and that's basically what they do. They go around trolling. They basically are patent trolls to the to the extreme, and they go down and they try to shut down people because of patents. And really, it's a symptom of, in my opinion, of the old economy and the way things used to be done. This whole corporate idea, and you know, the new way of thinking, the the this new decentralized um, um, eco economic uh, theory that's starting to become widespread now. We're starting to see a lot of open source technology and ideas and crowdfunding and things like that where it's no longer about having this protectionist economy and having all these patents and trying to take anybody to court that takes your patents. You know, the new economy is like, oh, you took my patent good because I made that so that the world can have this ideology, this old corporate regime along with the government. We know the government is always, you know, years behind the, po the population. So um, I think it, that it's a battle that's it's being won organically, and um, you know they're they're on the wrong side of history on this stuff, and I don't think that they're going to stand a chance. And I think it's only a matter of years before they either have to uh, rebrand themselves or or they'll become you know or they have to go out of business. Well, and this and this weekend mar uh, marks the one year anniversary of the march against Monsanto. So congratulations um, to you and your organization. Um, on starting the scratchers movement, I you know I'm just wondering have you have you have any of you received any backlash? Um, not really actually. I haven't got much, um, and if I do, I don't really take it. To, I don't take it personally. I've got a I've got a pretty extensive background in biotechnology, and I kind of understand this technology. A lot of people don't. A lot of people that talk about it don't really understand it very much. Um, but uh, you what, know, there, can, you, can you talk about your background a little bit? Is that your yeah, I, I took three years, I was three years studying under uh, Judy Heights, which is a pretty prominent uh, biotechnologist out here in San Diego. This was a special program in my high school, and we actually did genetically engineering in, in school and stuff like that, and mostly with bacteria. Um, but I'm 28. Okay, so this was a while back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, seeing there are some vi viable practices for for um, genetically modified genetic modification. For instance, with creating insulin, they, they the way that they create insulin is with genetically modified bacteria um, to treat diabetes. Now, it is kind of a uh, it is kind of uh, one of these things where 
the, these products are also causing diabetes as well. So I guess it is kind of a conflict of interest. But, you know, to me, it's, it's the science that has come out, this independent science. Most of it comes from outside the United States because our, med, our, uh, our uh, scientific establishment is, is, is full of special interest. And, it's, and when scientists come out against this technology, they kind of get demonized, discredited, or, or bullied out of it. So there is a lot of very good science coming out that shows the real danger of these pesticides that are that are linked with these uh, genetically modified crops, mainly this Roundup Ready stuff. Glyphosate is is very very close to Agent Orange. It's chemically it's very very similar to Agent Orange, and the government in the U.S. just keeps upping the amount, the safe you know the quote unquote safe amounts that they allow in the environment. Meanwhile, countries all around the world are either limiting it extremely or outright banning it. So, uh, you know, there's kind of a gap here in the United States just because most of the funding for a lot of this research comes from the same um, scientific establishment that the research is supposed to be keeping transparent. So there's a big conflict of interest there. And it really shows. Um, it, it shows by all these foreign uh, researchers, foreign universities that have found real problems with these products. And uh, the people here, the, the, the people here just don't get the funding to, to do this research that much. And like we said, uh, this weekend marks the one-year anniversary of the March against Monsanto. What, what, and if you could briefly just tell me what uh, we could expect from this weekend and where these marches are going to be taking place. Well, well from what, what I've seen is that this march is evolving. You know, the very first march was just, you know, get out on the streets and yell at the top of your lungs and, you know, um, be mad at Monsanto. Now, uh, we did one march in October. Uh, which was kind of a shift, a shifting period between that and kind of working on more solutions. Now we're starting to see, uh, for instance, in Los Angeles, uh, their event is uh, gardening against Monsanto. So they're actually going out and building gardens and, and educating people about how to take their food back. Here in San Diego, where I'm organizing, kind of the same thing. We're still having a march, but afterwards we're having five to ten workshops about how we can go about taking back our food. These different practices like aquaponics, and uh, vertical gardening, homesteading, and things like that, because um, I think the the people are becoming more aware of Monsanto, and now they're ready for the solutions. They're ready to act. They're ready to, to say, okay, what can we do about it? Um, and uh, be, going after the government is only a very small part of it, just because the government, as we've seen with the Prop 37, uh, is is it's really hard to get it's really hard to get the government to act when there's so much money involved and so many corporations embedded in with these gov with these government organizations so i think acting as uh, at the grassroots level is much more effective we affect their bottom line we, we we make them lose money we make them have to rethink things we decentralize which is the main thing because um, the biggest the biggest problem with for me is the over centralization of the food supply it makes us very very vulnerable if all of our food has to be shipped in from somewhere else, then if the gas prices go up or there's some kind of natural disaster, then people can be completely cut off from food. And then when people get cut off from food, they do really dumb things. So I think it's 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 mostly about you know decentralizing our food supply, and I think that's where the march has evolved into. Um, we still want uh, a lot of people still want the labeling. Some people want to get GMOs outright banned and things like that. I just don't think that those things are as much. The, for me personally, just because I don't have as much faith in, in, in getting the government to do things, I, I have more faith in the community doing things. Um, but I know a lot of people still in our march want to get these things banned and labeled and things like that. But I think we've come to the point now where we're ready to create solutions and we're ready to build these new ideas up to replace these old ideas and these outdated ideas. Well, awesome. Well, thank you very much. And, and where will the mar marches be uh, around the world? Oh, we have uh, over 300 events. We're in every continent except for Antarctica. So okay. if anybody if anybody wants to find a march, you just go to march-against-monsanto.com, and they, we have a Google spreadsheet right there where you can find it's in alphabetical order between continent, country, and then city. Uh, well, continent, country, state, and city. So it's really easy to find. You could find your state. You can find your city. And then you could just RSVP to the event and find all the details right there. So, yeah, just go to the site, march-against-monsanto.com, and then you can go from there. You can get in touch with the organizers, see if, you, if people want to get involved, they can get involved there. And, 
and uh, that's it. I mean, we're ready for Saturday. It's sh we're we're expecting we're expecting to be a bill. We're hoping to get um, some some real to make some real waves about this about this issue and about how we can go about fixing it. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for joining me today. Um, you can find this podcast through our Mint Press iTunes channel and on our website. You can tweet at us using ha uh, hashtag MintCast and tell us what you think about GMOs, GMO labeling, and Monsanto. You can also post on our Facebook page in our comment section to our pin post featuring this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>